Okay. We are recording, so hey. Good evening. This is past my bedtime, but I'm staying up for you because that's how much this topic means to me, how to thrive in veterinary medicine. So I'd like to know from you, what's the best thing that happened to you today? Put that in the chat box. What's the best thing that happened to you today? And uh, the best thing that happened to me while you're all putting that in, I think was taking my dog for a walk today, just in the weather here in upstate New York was amazing today, like high 70s. Um, it was incredible. I mean, here it is almost the end of October and um, th the weather is amazing. Let's see, my boyfriend cooked me dinner. That was very nice. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> what else? Tell me the best thing that happened. Ben and Jerry's for Tech Week. Yay! My baby about Vet Tech Week. Um, yeah. Trick or treated. Nice among our hospital staff. Beautiful. I love all the appreciation that's happening this week. Coming home to my dog. I love it. Trick or treating at work. You guys must work at the same place. So this is happening again. Home before nine o'clock. Oh, Elizabeth, this is this is a bonus, right? It's only eight o'clock. Took the day off and went with a friend to watch her horse lesson and see a cowboy work a horse. That sounds like super fun. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, good, good. All right. So I want to get going with you guys here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to some slides. I'm going to really give you an idea of who I am. Some of you that don't know me, I see a lot of familiar names here, but um, I know that there's some people who don't know who I am. So I'm going to give you some insight into who I am. And uh, I have some really good stuff for you tonight. And I hope that you're in a place where you can relax. Um, this will, you know, my, my plan here is that we spend an hour together. I hope you have an hour. Uh, I have some exciting things to tell you at the end about something new that I have. Um, another, another way to serve you. So I hope that uh, you stick around to the end. So let me switch to my slides here. And you should still be able to see me probably in a little box somewhere. Uh, all righty, here we go. How to thrive in veterinary medicine. Let's do this. <clears throat> all right, so for those of you that don't know who I am, this is baby Julie, I like to say. Uh, and baby Julie worked in a veterinary hospital, you know, eight million years ago. And uh, that's when I first got exposed to compassion fatigue, although we didn't call it that then. Uh, I since became a certified compassion fatigue specialist because in the 25 years that I have worked in the field, I have seen a lot of people struggling. I've seen a lot of people suffering. I've seen and known a lot of people um, that, you know, really were feeling as if they wanted to leave the work. Um, I also knew and have known many veterinarians that have taken their life, and that deeply pains me, and that inspires me and motivates me every single day to want to make a difference and to try to get a message out um, to help all in veterinary medicine and to help all that work with, with animals uh, in, in many different niches. So I'm also a certified life coach, and, and I come at compassion fatigue perhaps a little bit differently than, than some others, and you'll see that here tonight. Uh, we won't be talking about what compassion fatigue is. I'm going to guess you already know. I'm going to guess that you already are feeling some of the effects of that, and perhaps that's why you're here tonight. But I'm passionate about a lot of things that begin with the letter P, and the first one is peanut butter. Um, and you'll see a couple more in a few moments, but also personal development. Uh, I love cycling and I'm also extremely passionate about the mental health of all animal workers. And that's why I'm doing this work. And that's why I'm super motivated, um, to be out here, you know, speaking and doing workshops and, um, doing webinars and, and all that, that I can do to reach more people. So, uh, again, I'm really grateful that you took some time out of your super busy life to be with me here tonight. So I also love some other things that begin with P. Pugs. I've got two of them behind me that are snoring away. So if you're hearing anything, it's not me snoring, it's them. I also love pigs. And I know it's 
not a coincidence that they're only one letter apart, but uh, I also get to spend a fair amount of my uh, time at an amazing place near where I live here in upstate New York called Catskill Animal Sanctuary. And um, I guide tours there occasionally on the weekends and uh, I get to interact with a lot of pigs. So that's super fun for me because I, the more I'm, the more I actually understand pigs, I realize they're just like pugs and vice versa. Like they're really the same thing, just in a different outfit. That's what I'm convinced of. So here's where we're going tonight. Uh, I want to talk with you a little bit about what's getting in the way of you thriving in veterinary medicine. I'm going to share with you what I refer to as a 50-50 principle, um, which my goal here is that that helps, that helps free you up a little bit when you're not feeling the way you want to feel. I'm also going to share with you a practice that takes five minutes that has some pretty profound effects on people, and there's a lot of science behind it. And then I'm going to share with you my new baby called Compassion Fatigue RX. So um, that's where I'm headed. So first and foremost, one of the questions that I always ask when I am doing training, so I go around the country and I provide training on compassion fatigue and what to do about it to veterinary hospitals. And, and some of you um, know that very well about me. Um, and I do workshops and I speak at conferences and I do private coaching. And one of the things that always comes up is, you know, people come up to me all the time and they start telling me how they feel currently in their work. And, you know, the, the, the feelings range from, you know, exhausted, drained, irritable, numb, lack of compassion, apathetic, overwhelmed, frustrated, sometimes angry, right? I feel, and, and, and I'm hearing a lot of that. And I see a lot of that on social media too. And the one thing that I know is that no one wants to feel that way. When I ask people how they want to feel in this work, and the reason why we were all brought to this work is because we want to feel like we're making a difference. We want to feel appreciated. We want to feel trusted. We want to feel energetic. We want to feel peaceful and valued, right? We want to feel confident. And man, we just want to feel happy. I mean, we came to this work to make a difference, right? We came to this work to uh, alleviate suffering and pain in beings that can't speak to us. And yet, what I find happening is that in our dealings with the human beings that are attached to all of these creatures is what's dragging us down, is what's pulling us down. Not always, right? I work with people who, um, you know, sometimes are deeply distraught about the animals. And yeah, I know that that happens. Sometimes we're able to deal with that a little bit better. Sometimes we're able to rationalize that and to find some peace in what happens. Not always, but by and large, what I am seeing more of is just so many having struggles with dealing with the, the people aspect of the work. So I want to share with you what it is that's getting in the way. And partly what's getting in the way is our belief systems, um, what we were taught, what we're taught in our society, what we were taught as children. And really what that is, is that how others behave is resulting in how we're feeling. And when we're thinking that how we feel is dictated by how others behave, you can see all of a sudden it's setting us up for a lot of um, disappointment, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, uh, a lot of disempowerment, right? Because when we believe that external circumstances are what determine how we feel, then we have no power or any authority over how we feel. Do you see how that immediately sets us up really for failure, right? If the way I feel is determined by how other people act around me or behave around me or what they say to me or what they don't say to me, then I have no authority at all. And I'm at the mercy, if you will, of the world. And boy, that's a really disempowering place to be in. So when we, when, we, when we believe that others 
determine how we feel, what we end up having to do is trying to manipulate how other people behave. And that's extremely challenging because we can't control what other people do, right? Um, so what's happening here is, is that when we're thinking that our feeling states are coming from external, we lose our own sense of power. And that is a really important thing to realize. And most of us don't realize it. Because what ends up happening is we then start to believe that if other people would just do what we would want them to do, we'd be happy or we'd be less stressed or we'd be more relaxed or we'd love our job more. So here's what I can tell you is, you know, the people that I meet in veterinary medicine, by and large, are feeling this huge sense of disempowerment. And, and we're feeling like victims, right? Because we are at the mercy, again, of clients, our coworkers, our bosses, um, and any other person that we might be interacting with. So, you know, what I'm here to do is to give you your power back because I think by and large, we've given it away. We've given it to other people. And, you know, I want to give you your power back not only over how you feel, I want to give you your power back over your mental health, and I want to give you your power back over your happiness, clearly over your happiness. So there's a lot at stake here because here's what most of us you know, have grown up believing. First of all, we've grown up believing that our feelings, how we feel, let's say anger, frustration, sadness, guilt, happiness, joy, uh, any of them, any of our feelings, we've grown up, most of us, unless you grew up with maybe if you had a mental health professional as a parent, that must be awesome. That must be awesome. Um, then you might grow up completely differently. I didn't have that. So um, so, you know, I really grew up with the understanding that my, that circumstances, things that happen in the world are what create my feelings. Like I remember being told, and I'm sure a lot of you remember being told that, you know, that we can hurt each other's feelings by something that we say, oh, Julie, you hurt, you hurt mommy's feelings or, um, you know, you hurt Johnny's feelings or whatever that is, right? By something that you said. So when we think that, clients that say, you know, you're the most untrustworthy person I've ever met is what's creating our feeling of anger. Then again, we're really disempowered. We have no, we have no recourse there. And we end up being at the mercy again of what's happening around us, things that happen, what people do, what situations are, again, whatever the facts are. So here's what I want to share with you, that circumstances, things that happen, actually trigger thoughts, thoughts in our mind. It's the thoughts in our mind that create our feelings. It's not what happens, it's what we think about what happens. This is a huge distinction and it's a huge uh, revelation. We're, you know, to be honest, I didn't learn this until I was, I don't know, 40 years old. That's a really long time to be thinking that my feelings are coming from everything that's happening around me. No wonder no wonder I got stuck using drugs, alcohol, and food all to an excess in order to make myself feel better. Of course. Because when I had, you know, I couldn't change the world, so all I was able to do was to try to change myself by myself. Now, once I learned where my feelings actually came from, I have to tell you, it was as if my whole world opened up. And my whole world has changed dramatically since that. Like, I literally have power and authority over how I feel. Do I do it right all the time? Hell no. But I tell you what, I'm certainly aware of where, where I have control and where I don't have control. And that's a big distinction. So circumstances are facts. They're things we can prove in a court of law, right? So the client who says, you're only in it for the money, creates a thought in us, such as he doesn't appreciate us, that creates a feeling of anger or frustration. So the truth becomes this understanding that, you know, when we're looking for other people to make us happy, they're just terrible at it. Like we think if they would just behave a certain way, if clients would show up on time, if clients would do what we tell them to do, if clients would bring their animals in sooner, right, um, instead of waiting five days for something, we think that if they would do all of those things, 
that if they wouldn't check Google, um, you know, and, and based on our recommendation, that if they would just do those things, we would feel better. But the reality is people are terrible at making us feel good. Like literally they are. You know, why? Because that's an inside job. We have to generate our own feelings of self-worth, validation, happiness, joy. It doesn't come from outside. It comes from inside. And when we realize that, it totally frees us up. All of a sudden, we are able to allow people to be just who they are, right? I'll give you a great example of that. Uh, I travel a lot, as you probably know, like I'm on planes and in hotels every week. And when, and I've traveled a lot for years, like even, um, you know, when I was just working in industry sales, you know, I traveled a lot. But when I would come home from a business trip um, and I would walk into the house and let's say it's 10 o'clock at night, I've been on an airplane, delayed, sitting next to strangers, the whole nightmare that we know of, of traveling. And I'd get home, it's late, I walk in my house, my sink is filled with dishes, like for three days that, you know, my husband has let piled up. And I would go through the roof, literally and figuratively, like the whole, yeah, oh yeah, turn into nightmare, yes. Uh, sweet, calm Julie, peaceful Julie now, definitely has another side. Um, yeah, I would go crazy, I would go nuts. Why? Because I was convinced that he, he leaving the dishes there was causing me to feel that anger, right? So finally I said to him, him, John, can you please, you know, you have to understand I'm on these business trips. I'm really tired when I come home. The last thing I want to do is have to clean up the kitchen at 10 o'clock at night. Can you please put the dishes in the dishwasher? Why is that so difficult? It's right next to the sink. So then I would come home and the dishes wouldn't be in the sink anymore. They'd be in the dishwasher but the glasses would be on the bottom, the plates would be flipped upside down, the bowls would be turned the wrong way. So it's like, he couldn't win. He couldn't win. So, so people, they just, again, they'll, they will disappoint us over and over and over again in trying to make us happy because they just can't live up to our expectations, right? So guess what? Now I generate that for myself. It doesn't matter what the condition of the house is. Why? Because when I, when I walk in the door, like that's a circumstance. Dishes in the sink is a circumstance. What I think about it will determine how I feel about it. And how I feel about it will determine the next course of action. So stick with me on that one because that becomes important. How we feel fuels what we do. All right. So what's the solution? By now, you must be wondering, what's the solution? I'm hearing all the problems, but what's the solution? Yeah, I'm totally with you. Um, I'm a solutions-based kind of girl, that's for sure. So first and foremost is recognizing that you are not your thoughts. We have 60,000 thoughts per day. Like our mind, our brain is a thought-generating machine. It just goes on and on and on and on. All the time, it's just generating thoughts. And most of the time, believe it or not, it's generating suggestions for us. Suggestions. Um, and, and or um, negative thoughts. So out of those 60,000 thoughts we have a, per day, the majority are negative, the majority are repeats. And, you know, and based on going back even to when we were kids, like a lot of that, the story we tell ourselves how we're not good enough, not smart enough, not thin enough, not tall enough, not blonde enough, whatever that might be, generally speaking, is coming from some place um, in our childhood. And, and, and we've just continued on with those stories over and over and over and over again. And until we're taught that we are not our thoughts, we think that all of that is true. Again, your mind generates words. Thoughts are just a whole bunch of words. And you know, the more I do this work, not only on myself, but work with other people on it, it's just fascinating to me to find out what my mind generates. Just last night, as a matter of fact, I went to bed and all of a sudden my mind started generating thoughts about this webinar and, um, you know, and negative thoughts like no one will show up, you know, all of that. And I actually, so because I realize I'm not my thoughts, I actually am able to have some space there and some distance and kind of laugh uh, at, my, at my mind. And what I'm able to do is sort of like what you do in your inbox. You know how you go into your inbox and you just, you see a bunch of emails sitting there and you, you know all the stuff that's junk, like the Bed Bath & Beyond stuff and the, um, all the other sales, Kohl's and all those that send emails every day. So you know how you just go down depending upon your email 
um, server, whatever, and you just click, you click the little box and then you hit delete and you just get rid of them all. Well, that's the same thing that I do with my thoughts. Like all of those thoughts that don't serve me, it's almost like I'm just, I'm just dismissing them, dismissing this one, dismissing that one. Um, because I know that it's all garbage. It is, it's just all garbage. So recognizing that you're not your thoughts, that is not who you are. That is what your brain does. Right. That's part. And, and becoming aware of what you're actually thinking, which sounds, you know, for some of us very easy, for others not so easy. Until we spend some time turning up the volume on that and actually paying attention to what it, what's actually going on in there, uh, and then deciding whether or not those are thoughts that are actually serving us and thoughts that we want to keep thinking. Lots of times they're not thoughts that we want to keep thinking, but yet we're so conditioned to just keep thinking them because we don't know there's another way or we don't know how to create that space in there to recognize what it is that we're thinking and that we are able to dismiss some of those thoughts, right? So, and there are times that we do want to, and this is a big thing of what I teach people is that, you know, we can choose different thoughts very easily. We do it all the time but mostly we don't do it deliberately. So I'm gonna give you a really extreme example. So let's say that you are in a relationship with somebody. This is a really extreme example. Um, and you have loving thoughts about them and you have loving thoughts about them and loving thoughts about them and loving thoughts about them. And then all of a sudden you find out that, they've cheated, that they cheated on you. And then all of a sudden in a split second, you change the way you think about them, in a split second right? So what I'm offering you is that we can think different thoughts deliberately. Deliberately. We can tell our minds what to think. And I do that all day long. I tell my mind what to think. I tell my mind what to think about my work, about how I want to show up in the world. I tell my mind what to think about other people. Why? Because I know that my thoughts create my feelings and I don't want to feel disempowered. I don't want to feel angry and frustrated and overwhelmed all the time. Maybe sometimes I do, and that's the beauty. Sometimes we want to think those thoughts, right? When something really sad happens or somebody dies, absolutely we want to think thoughts that make us sad. Um, those aren't necessarily thoughts that we want to change, but it's the thoughts that aren't serving us. It's the thoughts in regards to our work where we all of a sudden um, – have a feeling where, you know, we don't like people anymore and we think people suck and uh, we think people, you know, we have all these thoughts about what people should and shouldn't do. And I'm talking about clients here. Those are some of the thoughts that we need to start thinking about. And yesterday I was doing a seminar uh, in a practice and it, one, of, one of the staff members said, uh, well, we deserve to be respected by clients. And I was like, well, actually, you know, you don't deserve to be respected. Like, it's great if you are, and I hope that you are, but you don't deserve it. Like, we don't deserve respect. We deserve self-respect, but we don't deserve respect from other people. Now, granted, again, like I said, it's fantastic when we are respected, and I wish that for you all, but that's not always the case. Not everyone that we deal with does respect us, um, but we can still be okay with that. Why? Because depending on what we're making that mean determines how we're going to feel about it. So the last thing here really is when you realize all of that I've been teaching you so far, what you'll find is that you are not at the effect of your life. You're actually the cause of your life. And at first that feels like I've just hit you over the head with a wet towel, I guess. But, but actually, let me reframe it for you. It's actually the best news ever. When I tell you that you're not at the effect of life, that you're the cause of your life, then guess what? That, that there you have your power, right? When you understand that your thoughts are what are creating your feelings, game over, game over. So let me, let me show you what this looks like. Um, and this is a model I use quite frequently. It's based on cognitive psychology, and it was put together um, by master life coach Brooke Castillo. But it's based on cognitive psychology and all the thought leaders uh, in the self-help um, field, actually. So what this model teaches us are that circumstances trigger thoughts. Our thoughts cause our feelings, like I've said about 
20 times already. Um, our feelings fuel our action. Our actions create our results. So what are circumstances? Circumstances are facts. They're things we can prove in a court of law, right? The patient died. The client opted for euthanasia. The client said, you're only in this for the money. Your boyfriend cooked you dinner. Like all those things, those are, those are circumstances. Thoughts, thoughts are literally just one sentence in our mind about the circumstance. Thoughts are words, right? So thoughts, thoughts are things like he shouldn't have done that. She should be nicer to us. She should be, she should take better care of her pet. She shouldn't have a pet if she can't afford it. I love my boyfriend, right? Those are all thoughts. Feelings are emotions, right? They're things that we feel in our body uh, and they are caused by our thoughts. And our actions are our behavior, what we do or don't do as a result of the way we feel. So we always do something based on how we feel. We either act, react, or inact based on how we feel. Our feelings are what fuel our actions. So sometimes, um, based on our feelings, we might lash out at people, or we might shut down or wall ourselves off, or retreat, or we might use um, substances, right? And our results, our results are what we see in the world based on our actions. So that could be things like job dissatisfaction, that could be compassion fatigue, that could be uh, in a great relationship, that could be um, writing a book, that could be, um, uh, creating a, a fantastic relationship with a client. Like all those things are, are, could be results. So if you've been paying attention in this model, you're going to notice that for the most part, like, so for the most part, we can't control circumstances. Circumstances are generally speaking out of our control, but everything there on down in the model is totally within our control. Why? Because it's all based on our thinking. So we get to determine what to think about everything and anything. Your thoughts are a choice and your thoughts are optional. Oh my gosh, that's the best news. When I learned that, I'm telling you, it was, a, it was the biggest change in my life when I learned that. And I didn't learn it in therapy. My goodness, I was in a lot of therapy. Nobody ever taught me that. Oh, I still get mad about that. <laughs> But I'm teaching it to you here tonight, so um, that's wonderful. All right, so let's check in here. Let's talk a little bit about um, facts versus our interpretation. So there are the facts that I've already explained to you. So we know what facts are, right? Again, they're, they're, they're circumstances, the things we can prove in a court of law. And then what happens is everything else is our interpretation of the facts. So for instance, client is late. And that's a fact. We can prove in a court of law that they're late. Um, but our interpretation of that sometimes is things like they don't respect our time. Another fact, dog is euthanized because the owner can't afford treatment. Well, again, we can prove that. Our thought sometimes is, and I hear this a lot, they shouldn't have a dog if they can't afford to take care of it. Again, that's just our interpretation of it. Fact, client says the issue has been going on for five days. Our interpretation of that sometimes is, well, now all of a sudden it's an emergency and we're supposed to bend over backwards for people and double book and get them in here today and, you know, all of that. Fact, patient dies unexpectedly. Our interpretation of that sometimes is, you know, again, that we blame ourselves that we did something wrong. And lastly, client Googles their pet's diagnosis. We can interpret that sometimes to mean they don't trust us. So think about this, right? So, and again, we have a lot of these thoughts, and these thoughts are creating our feelings. And I'm going to um, imagine that most of these thoughts aren't creating great feelings, right? So let me give you some, some other ways to interpret the same exact thing, right? So it's all based on our interpretation. So here's the beautiful thing. Facts, circumstances are all neutral. They're neutral. They're not good or bad until we have a thought about them. 
That's the honest to goodness truth. So I'll use an extreme example here. Um, a dog dying is not, is not sad all the time, right? Um, and, and I think most of you know that because we do experience sometimes relief when a patient dies, right? Especially when there's been suffering a long time. So, so the circumstance, again, is always neutral. It's just depending on what we think about it that makes it either good or bad. So now I'm showing you those same facts and interpreting them a little bit differently. So the client is late. Here's another way to interpret it. I've been late for an appointment. I've been late for lots of appointments. Dog is euthanized because the owner can't afford treatment. Another way of thinking about that could be, and again, I'm just offering you the fact that, guess what? We have choices in how we think about things. Our, our thoughts are optional. It's not my situation to judge. I don't know what's going on for them, but I do know that he was humanely euthanized, right? I did a whole session yesterday about finding compassion for difficult people. And mostly it comes down to the fact that we do not know what's going on for other people. And as human beings, we're just very judgmental. It's just, it's part of human nature that we judge others on what we think they should or shouldn't do. Um, you know, that's just part of the human condition, but yet we can choose to think about things differently. Client says issue has been going on for five days. Another way to think about that, people are busy and, and many will wait a couple days to see if it clears up on its own. Guilty. I do that all the time. Serious. I know. Call me terrible. You know, I worked in a veterinary hospital. I managed a veterinary hospital. I worked in the field for 25 years. Uh, I know that I should go the first day, but guess what? I'm busy. I'm busy. And it is a hassle. Like it or not, it's a hassle to get to the vet sometimes. And I'm also hoping that sometimes things clear up on their own, right? And you know, there's like that, um, there's that, that, that funny rule um, that, that uh, says something like 50% of the time things clear up. I think it says 50% of the time things clear up on their own. So I'm always looking for that 50% sometimes too. So yeah, I'm a terrible pet owner too sometimes. It's true. All right, patient dies unexpectedly. Another interpretation. Again, rather than we did something wrong, um, we didn't see that coming and not sure how we could have, right? And that's just showing some compassion for ourselves. Uh, clients Google pets diagnosis happens all the time. They're, do, they're Googling something all the time, right? Dr. Google. Well, another way to think about that rather than that they don't trust you is just the fact that they're just trying to get information. They're trying to be well-informed. They feel uh, helpless because they don't know what's going on. They want to be informed. They want to have lots of information. They don't want to feel like an idiot when they're in your presence, right? Um, so again, just offering you the fact that we are capable of thinking about things in all different ways. And what it comes down to it always is, is the way that we're thinking about things serving us. If you don't like how you're feeling in the work, then what we need to be able to do is look at the thoughts that are creating those feelings and decide if we want to think something differently. And what I've been talking to you about for this whole time of, this, of the webinar is the fact that, um, or this whole concept of emotional responsibility. And what that means is that we are responsible for how we feel. We're 100% responsible. People are allowed to behave any way they want in this world. They are. And if it's illegal, we'll call the police. But most of the time, it isn't illegal. People just behave the way they do. But we get to decide how to feel about it because we get to decide how to interpret all of that. And again, when you start um, really recognizing this connection between thoughts and feelings, it opens up a whole new world for you. So I think that's a really great segue here to um, move into the second uh, thing I had to offer you, which is the 50-50 principle. And, you know, there's this illusion um, that we're supposed to be happy all the time. And I don't know where it comes from. It's, I don't know if it's just society-based or what, but like there's this illusion that we're supposed to be happy all the time. And when we're not, then we think there's something wrong with us. 
And when we think there's something wrong with us, then we start dumping negative thoughts about ourselves on top of already negative thoughts. Do you see what's happening here? Yeah. So what I want to offer you is um, something that I think will be somewhat comforting to you, hopefully. So the reality is that this, this thing we call life, like I think you can expect to feel positive emotion 50% of the time and negative emotion 50% of the time. Like that's the real world. And that's, I'm not talking, my glass isn't like half full. Um, what I'm talking about here is, you know what? Bad things happen in the world. I mean, I, don't, I know I don't need to sell you on the idea that bad things happen in the world. Um, if you have a heartbeat, um, you already know that because we're seeing lots of bad things that happen in the world. But on all, and that's all part of the 50% the, the negative emotion, right? That bad things do happen. And it's part of the human experience. It's what we all signed up for as being human beings. We signed up for it. We did. That half the time, we're going to feel like crap. And it's okay. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us. It means that this is the 50% of the time that we feel like crap. And, you know, this is something that I wish was taught because you, you start looking around, you know, even at um, celebrities and things like that. And I can't help thinking about um, uh, the musician Chris Cornell who – who recently committed suicide. And, and, you know, there was a person who, you know, made boatloads of money, right? He went on stage and had thousands of people screaming for him and, and admiring him and showing him appreciation. Um, but yet inside, he didn't feel good, right? Inside, he didn't feel good. And, and again, I don't, ex I don't pretend to know what was going on for him or anything like that. But I do wonder sometimes, like, if he knew that, like, that's just the, that's part of the deal, like 50% of the time, we're not going to feel so great. We don't have to make it mean anything more than this is the human experience. And I can be okay with feeling sadness and feeling frustration sometimes and feeling anger and feeling overwhelmed sometimes. Like, I can be okay with that because I know how to do all those emotions. And I don't need to numb them out with drugs and alcohol and food and shopping and Facebook, right? I don't need to do that because I can handle all those things. Why? Because I know that it's a balance. Because I know that without the negative, I wouldn't even know what the positive is. Without feeling despair, I wouldn't know what joy feels like. Without feeling anger, I wouldn't know what happiness feels like right? Again, there has to be that balance. Um, so I tell you that hopefully to give you a little peace, to let you know that in the times when you're not feeling so great about your work, your life, yourself, can you just find within yourself to go, ah, this is that 50% of the time. Aha, I can do this. It's nothing more than that. It's like, I know how to feel discomfort. I know how to feel sad sometimes and it's okay. The reality is when it comes to emotions, other than things like, um, you know, death of, of a loved one um, is different. Those emotions, they don't pass through us quickly. Those emotions, you know, need more time to process. But a lot of our other emotions or negative emotions um, can pass through us quite quickly if we just surrender to them. Instead of fighting them and going, I'm not supposed to feel this. I'm supposed to love this work. It's all I've ever wanted to do was being a veterinarian and now I don't like it and now I'm going to beat myself up about it. Um, or being a vet tech or a manager. Um, if we can just surrender and go, ah, oh, I can handle this. I can feel this. Because when we finally just feel the emotion, it will pass through us. Versus when we're resisting it all the time, thinking we're not supposed to feel it, all it's doing is building up, building up, building up. And it's like when you try to hold that beach ball underneath the water, you can only hold it underneath the water for so long and finally it's going to pop up. So uh, the, the other thing I wanted to share with you, the third thing I wanted to share with you was what I refer to as the five-minute miracle. Oh my goodness. And I love the research behind, um, behind gratitude. And it's one of the reasons why I started this webinar asking you about something great that happened to you today. 
and I, I'm, you know, for some of us, when I ask that for, for people, like they kind of are a little like, wait a minute, what something good? Like our brain almost is like, wait a minute, wait a minute, error, error. Who's asking for something good that happened? I want to tell you what something negative that happened today, right? Because our brains, again, um, we have this negativity bias, right? Our brains focus on um, negative things. Negative things hold more weight in our minds than positive things. So our brain loves negative things. Why? Because it's just kept us alive for so long. So um, here's a way that you can actually think about um, something like um, you know, gratitude and shifting your focus onto something that's positive. So let me define what gratitude is. Gratitude really is, you know, a state of thankfulness or, or a state of appreciation. And what we know from the research, what we know from the science is that grateful people are more hopeful, they're healthier, they sleep better, they have better self-esteem, they're more empathetic, and they're more resilient. All things that you totally need in your work, right? I know you need all of those things for sure. So how can we become, or how can we, we create some gratitude? Like, what does it look like? And there's three parts to it. The first part of gratitude is recognizing, recognizing something that we're grateful for, and then acknowledging it, and then appreciating it, right? Like today I was talking about the beautiful day. Like I recognize like today was like a super special day. Like the weather was just amazing. And I acknowledged the fact that, you know, what the, what the breeze felt like. And then I was able to open the windows. And I appreciated the fact that I was able to sit out on my front porch and uh, in, you know, the end of October and experience that. So here's what I can offer you that gratitude practices can be super short. Like you need like literally like five minutes in order to have a gratitude practice. And even that, like the research in gratitude um, has shown that practices such as five minutes make a huge difference to people. So a couple ideas. One that I really love is making a list of three things. And you can do this in the morning. You can do this before bed. You can do this on the way home from work where you literally just ask yourself, what are three things that I'm grateful for? What are three things that happened today that I'm thankful for? And I would ask you to not be too easy on yourself here where you allow yourself to give the same answer repeatedly. Like, you know, saying, I woke up or, you know, like, um, I had food in my refrigerator. Like, I don't allow myself to use the same things over and over again. I really challenge myself to find new things. And sometimes it can be a struggle. I mean, there's d difficult days where it's like, I'm thankful for sheets on my bed. Um, so that's the first one. Another practice is creating a gratitude journal where you decide on a time of day where you want to sit down for a few moments and just uh, creatively write about something that you're grateful for and just kind of expand on that um, in a journal fashion. Another thing that you can do is experience present moment gratitude. And that is when you find yourself in a situation that um, you're appreciative of, that you literally just stop in the moment and recognize it as that, right? Maybe that's, um, you know, being at work and, and just sharing a moment with a coworker. Maybe that's being in, in the exam room with, you know, a favorite client or a favorite patient. Um, maybe it's being with a significant other and just, you know, having a moment of, um, peace or tranquility where you just recognize, ah, oh, everything's right with the world right now. Let's just, let's just take this in. Let's appreciate it. Let's be thankful for it. Maybe it is, you know, a great cup of coffee in the morning where it's like, you're just grateful for the fact that, you know, you have water that comes right out of the faucet. Isn't that amazing? Like sometimes I'm like, kidding me? Water comes out of the faucet. There are people who live in the world who don't have water that comes out of the faucet. I am grateful for that. Or electricity. Or Wi-Fi. Or, you know, that I have a cell phone. Right? Yeah. Like, it's really fun. This will blow your mind. It's super fun to practice gratitude when you're paying your cell phone bill. Um, when you're like, I'm so 
dang happy to pay this bill because I have this phone that does all these amazing things for me. Yeah, that's fun. How about writing a handwritten letter? Uh, and this can be, you know, a letter maybe to somebody that you have neglected to thank for something um, that they did. Or maybe it's a letter to someone, um, I've been meaning to tell you kind of letter. I've been meaning to tell you what you mean to me or how much I appreciate you. Uh, who doesn't love getting a letter in the mail? My goodness, when's the last time you got a letter in the mail? My God. Yeah. Uh, how about, you know, sharing it, social media, you can share just that something that you're grateful for. Just put a post that you're grateful for something, um, that will get people's interest or, you know, just even in conversation, sharing your, your gratitude list for the day. It just starts to spur other people and it can be contagious, which is a fantastic thing. And then there's simply, you can sometimes just put your hands on your heart and be grateful for yourself and your intention in this world, and what it is that you're here to do, even if you aren't perfect all the time, but the fact that you have these desires, and you have these wishes to make the world a better place, and to help animals, and perhaps to help people, um, and just being thankful for who you are in all of it, in all of your messiness, and all of your complexity, and all of it, just who you are, exactly who you are, the beautiful mess that you are. I'm a beautiful mess too. So those are just some ideas of how to bring gratitude into your life. And I'm, I tell you, um, a little bit really makes a difference. It's something that um, really shifts your focus. And all of a sudden, again, your brain is always looking for evidence of the negative. This takes your brain and does this all of a sudden where it now has to uh, look for positive things. And you're in a sense, you're sort of working against the negativity bias. The negativity bias says that you need three positive things to outweigh one negative thing. Interesting, right? Yeah. So, um, awesome. All right. Just checking my time here. We are doing great. So what I wanted to share with you, the last thing I wanted to share with you is something I'm super excited uh, to share with you. And this is a new course that I put together. Um, and if anything resonated with you in this webinar and you wanted to work at a, on this stuff and you wanted to work with me, this is an opportunity to do that. That's why I created this course. So what this course is, it's a live online course. This isn't a self-study course. Um, I do lots of personal development. And I sign up for lots of courses that are self-study and um, I don't finish half of them. I'm embarrassed to tell you that, but it's true. I don't because I get busy uh, or I forget or something. But so I like courses that keep me accountable. And this is a live course, meaning that we're all going through it together. Um, so it's six weeks long. There is a one week break in the middle because it starts on October the 30th. And there's, I built in a break the week of Thanksgiving. Um, so that's sort of a catch-up week. So right smack dab in the middle. So what the course includes is six modules that have video and audio lessons that you are able to consume when it's convenient for you uh, in any way that you want to consume them, whether on video or if you want to listen to them as you're driving to work. That's perfectly great. Um, whatever works for you. Easy to, easy to consume. There will be six short but impactful worksheets that go along with each lesson. And the worksheets are designed so that you start to get some insight into um, why you do some of the things that you do, what builds your belief systems, why you're not taking better care of yourself, um, maybe why you're not creating the boundaries you need to. I'll show you the modules here in a second. But the worksheets really are about insight. They're about tapping into who we are and giving ourselves our own attention. Um, when I know that I've made the biggest strides in my own personal development, when I've been held to accountability and in a daily practice form, um, of actually having to think about some things in my life and write it down, writing things down. So this is taking, this is taking the information that I teach in the lessons, which we're able to consume, but I'm then being able to put it into action for you. And that's what makes the change in our life. When we just consume information uh, without any action, generally speaking, we don't make much change. But when we can put things into action, that's when the shifts happen. 
There will be six support calls, so weekly calls, um, that uh, will enable me to dive a little bit deeper into some of the lessons, but also enable you to receive some coaching and support um, on a weekly basis so that we stay connected, so that uh, the group really is moving together at the same um, pace and that so that you have support that we're able to really focus on this not just on one day not just for five minutes when you watch a video lesson but so that it's sustainable and I'm also offering two private coaching sessions with me those are you know I, I, I already privately coach people but this is um, something I'm adding into the program so you'll have two 60-minute coaching sessions uh, with me to be used whenever you want for the duration of the program um, and a little bit, I'm extending it a little bit after the program ends just um, for if you aren't able based on your schedule to get them in during the, during the time frame of the, of the course. And then I am creating, and I wasn't going to do this and I changed my mind. I went back and forth a million times and I'll tell you, I wasn't going to create a Facebook group, but um, mostly because Social media for me is one of the things that I train people on all the time about, you know, stepping back from because it tends to be very negatively driven. And I got to be honest with you, the veterinary Facebook groups that I have seen um, can be very negative. Um, and so here's what, I, so that's why I wasn't going to create it. But I changed my mind because I said, you know what? unique that is unlike any other Facebook group that's out there that's actually positive. And that's going to be, you know, on me to keep it that. But what I want to be able to do in this Facebook group is to talk about, you know, the challenges that we might be having, but then how do we deal with them in a positive, constructive way that's helpful to us and not hurtful to us? So yeah, we're still going to be talking about, you know, what people do and some of the crazy stuff that clients do. And, um, but, but we'll also be able to talk about you know, what we can do about them, right? And how we can find a positive solution to that. So uh, the modules, the modules, I love the modules. The first one is about how to coach yourself to feel better. I will teach you how to change your thinking. A little bit of what I've taught you tonight, but in a deeper way, because I'm not able to go that deep in an hour long webinar. Um, I will also be, the module number two is, this would be great if it weren't for the people, how to deal with difficult people. Module three is, it's not you, it's me. This is creating and enforcing boundaries, right? How do we create and enforce boundaries with not only workers, Uh, module four is serenity now, how to reduce stress. And I'm going to be talking about not just the things that we hear about in our society, but some, um, some unique ways to, to work with stress and some things that you probably haven't been exposed to before. Number five, I have to throw in some badass self-care there. Why? Because most of the people I work with um, do not have a self-care practice, do not take very good care of themselves and are exhausted and depleted. And I know who you are. So this is for you. <laughs> and number six is mindfulness and meditation for sanity. And um, if you've tried meditation before and think that you can't, I'm here to tell you it's not true. Uh, but there's tons of research of the benefits of meditation. And again, short practices. Um, I won't be teaching you to meditate for an hour. It'd be great if you want to. And if you already are, that's fantastic. But um, that's, you know, I, I like to start really small with people and, and, and find achievable goals rather than things that are insurmountable. So those are all the modules. Uh, and the big question always is, you know, well, how do I know if this is right for me? It's right for you if you work with animals because this will be for animal workers only. And the niches that I work with are veterinary medicine, animal welfare, and I work with lab animal uh, folks as well. Uh, it's right for you if you're on this webinar because you came to a webinar about how to thrive in veterinary medicine. So clearly there's some interest there. If you want to feel better, this is definitely for you because I'm going to teach you how to coach yourself in feeling better as well as boundaries and self-care and all of that. If you want to take better care of yourself, this is for you. If you want accountability, I'm your girl. I'm your accountability partner in this. Uh, and if you want support, also me. That's where I come in. 
So here's what's happening. Um, opening registration actually tonight, um, right after this call. And I'm offering an early bird discount of $50 off if you enroll before the 26th. So uh, normally it would be $347, but it is $297. Um, I really want to make it affordable as possible. So um, that, is, um, that is the price. And... I'm going to stop my screen share here. That is the link. It's also, if you want the link, you can just go right to my website and it's under courses, but um, stop my screen share here because I know there was, might be some questions. Um, let's see. Are there any questions? If there's questions, let's see, put them in the chat, please. Any questions? When is the course date? When is the starting date for the course? It will start on the first module will be sent out on Monday, October the 30th. And again, it runs seven weeks. So uh, it will end again. The course is six weeks. I built in a break. So the last um, it will end like right before the holidays. I think like December 13th. I'm just looking at my little and, you know, it brings up a good point because I think for people who maybe get challenged around the holidays. I think this would be a really beautiful way to slide into the holidays with um, some practices behind your belt, some real, real serious self-care, some real ownership of how to manage your mind, your thinking, your feelings, all of that. Uh, when will you run the course again? Uh, yes, I will be running the course again after the holidays. Yeah, of uh, January. Yes, January. Uh, let's see. Any other questions here? Um, any questions on anything else that I taught tonight? Was this helpful? Was this a good hour of your time? Any tips on remaining consistent with gratitude practice? I find myself not doing those practices when the work week has been really hectic and stressful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what? I think my... My um, tip to that is to have something that's consistent. If it's like a journal or if it's um, something that's, in other words, that you see it all the time so that it's constantly in your face. And then that becomes an issue of your self-talk. We can become very black and white, right? Like when all of a sudden we don't do something for a day and we go, well, you know, forget it. I've already screwed up. I might as well just forget it completely. When we can manage our self-chatter to go, hey, just because I got one flat tire doesn't mean I'm going to go around my car and puncture all the others, right? Just because uh, I'm late for work on Monday doesn't mean I'm going to then show up late every other day. It's like we do that all the time. We do this black and white thinking. So I think it's about managing our, our self-talk because that's what gets us off of a habit. It's the chatter in our mind. I hope that's helpful because yeah, I know you're right. Like it's like we're really good at something until push comes to shove and then you know, when things get stressful, all of our great practices we leave behind. But um, when we have practices that just take a short period of time, just a little amount of time, five minutes, we are less apt to let them go because we always have five minutes, even with the stress. Where we get into trouble is when we have practices like, you know, that take us um, an hour or something. And they're like, well, I don't have an hour. I've been at work until nine o'clock at night. So having these short practices, I think, can be really helpful. And again, just managing that chatter. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Hi, Mel. Good to see you. <laughs> Such a great supporter of mine. I heart you. I just heart you. And I heart all of you vet techs that are on here. Uh, thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, this will be sent out to you. Also, we'll send out the link for the course if you want any more information on that. Feel free to email me. Um, you'll have that as well. And uh, I love the fact that so many people showed up tonight to spend some time on their mental health. And, and the last thing I will say to you is there's nothing, nothing more important than your mental health. Um, absolutely nothing. And, you know, I'm all about investing in it, either time, money, whatever it might be, um, every single day, because there's nothing more important than it. So it's been my honor to be with you all tonight. Uh, and I wish you the best in all that you do. I care deeply about you. Take super good care of yourself. And thank you for what you do. All right.
Take care. Bye-bye.